Welcome to Blackbird Writers Presents. Today I have with me Tim Chapman. He is um, a fiction writer and artist and publisher. His fiction has been published in the Southeast Review, the Chicago Reader, Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, Palooka, and the anthology The Rich and the Dead. His first novel, A Trace of Gold, was a finalist in Shelf Unbound's 2013 Best Indie Book Competition. His latest novel is The Blue Silence. When he's not writing, he's teaching martial arts or painting pretty pictures. <laughs> Welcome, Tim. Hey, Tracy. Good to see hey. you. Hey, good to see you too. We're here today because you've recently released uh, a literary magazine, which is Art and Literature in the Groove, Lit Bop Mag. This is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, really happy with it. It's our second issue. Um, looks like we're on schedule to print one a year. So um, yeah, it's uh, a nice feeling of accomplishment to be able to bring lots of artists and writers into uh, the public space. Oh, well, and I imagine because, I mean, what a great, huge undertaking, you know? I mean, I know authors who self-publish um, their one book, but now you're talking about bringing in, you know, 42 authors and artists and poets and um, it just, it, it sounds daunting to me. <laughs> it's Yeah, it was a big job. I had some help. Um, two of the people I uh, taught English with at Malcolm X College, Rachel Robbins and Lonnie Montreal, helped with the um, uh, the vetting process, figuring out what we wanted to publish. And then uh, another friend of mine, uh, Rand Van Vink, he did most of the proofreading. He did the early proofreading on it, which was an enormous task. So um, I'm really thankful to those three people as well. Wow. So yeah, I would imagine it takes like a team. Yeah, I'm hoping yeah. I can uh, sucker them in to help me out next year. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> yeah. So you are the author of the Sean McKinney Mysteries um, and A Trace a trace of Gold and The Blue Silence. Um, okay. But you've also written a lot of short stories. Um, so what do you like best about like that vehicle for storytelling? Um, short stories. I love writing short stories, first of all, because um, it's like instant gratification. You know, it doesn't take as long to write as a novel. Um, plus, I'm able to be engaged with it um, a little more thoroughly. When I'm writing a novel, I have to go back and keep rereading from the beginning in order to get back into the characters where with a short story, you know, it's, it's really right there. You're only talking about, you know, 10 or 20 pages. So, so that's, that's helpful. But I also feel like I can, it's a challenge to be able to, to present characters that have some depth to them in a short story. In a novel, you've got all this space to try and establish who they are. In a short story, you've really got to dive into their personality and their motivation. Um, so in a way, it's kind of like uh, good practice. You know, If I can really get it right in a short story, then the chances are good that I'll be able to do something similar with the characters in a novel. Yeah. Um, I some, I'm sorry. I sometimes use it as a palate cleanser too. If I'm stuck somewhere while I'm working on a novel, I'll stop for a couple of weeks, write a short story and then go back. That's a great idea. I like that. And, and cause you, I think um, I like the idea of being able to take one of your characters and plug them into just something random at, at like an event or something mm -hmm. and and make it really happen yeah. yeah and and what what's your favorite genre that's a tough one I started out writing crime fiction because I had worked for a while as a forensic scientist and so I felt like that was something that I had a handle on um but in the course of writing those stories and the two Sean McKinney novels, I found that like a lot of what I was doing was really just 
telling people's stories. Um, so it was it it was sort of beyond the genre. The 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 plot wasn't as important to me as telling the stories of the characters. So a lot of the short stories that I've written haven't been genre stories. They've been I don't know I don't know if I would call them literary fiction. I don't even know what how that's defined anymore, unless it's just fiction that doesn't have um, a killing or you know a spaceship but <laughs> yeah. yeah but yeah the, just really telling people's stories you know i get a lot of stuff from my own past and i get a lot of dialogue from eavesdropping on people's conversations in restaurants that's always you know a good way to uh, pick up something that you might be able to turn into something later on yeah <laughs> Good advice. Just, just don't let them know you're doing it. Don't like take <laughs> notes in front of them. <laughs> yeah. Wait, could you repeat that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And and so you're also an artist, a visual artist. And yes. um, I see one of your paintings behind you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the ones that I uh, have in this issue of Lip Pop. Uh -huh. um, What's your so medium? What do you use? Uh, this is uh, water miscible oils. So they blend the same way that regular oil paints do, um, but they don't smell as bad and they're easier to clean up. Mm. So, um, and I don't really, I don't really understand the the chemistry behind them, but they're they're really malleable. Um, they don't dry as quickly as acrylics. They're not. They don't have that plasticky feel to them. Um, mm -hmm. They they look and feel on the brush, um, just like oil paint, ex huh. except that, you know, they don't smell bad. That's maybe kind of a nice feature. Yeah. 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 I, I, I love working with them. When I was little, I used to go with my mom to her art classes and because she was she was taking classes at Heron School of Art in Indiana. And um and I just, I remember that strong smell of the oil paint. It was like, you knew there was creativity at work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so how are you able to express yourself differently in visual art as opposed to storytelling? Yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole different process. Visual art for me is, um, it's it's almost meditative, so I can put on music while I'm painting. Um, in invariably jazz, I love listening to bebop when I paint, and um, the music sort of helps to inspire thought processes while I'm working on the canvas. Um, you know, I have an idea. I, I lay things out in in pencil or charcoal before I jump on with the paint but I never really know where I'm going to end up. And sometimes getting into it and the music and um, being able to shut everything else out, it just feels like, like it's an automatic process. Whereas writing, I can't have any stuff going on in the background. I can't write with music on because I have to be totally in my head and totally in the characters. Right. Uh, I'm in the same way. I, I have, don't know. Are you? Yeah. yeah. I don't know how people do it. I have heard of people who put music on when they're writing and I don't, I don't, I get caught up in the, their words. Oh, sure. Right. I figured out how to write in um, coffee shops, which I enjoy doing just as a, a change of pace. Um, I'll put on headphones, but I won't have anything playing. So, you know, it helps to muffle the noise and then nobody talks to me because they figure out. <laughs> <Thank you. yeah. laughs> Right. That's a great trick. Yeah, it works. <laughs> so um, let's talk about Lit Bop a little bit. Sure. Um, now you're compiling all of these short stories and the art and poetry. Um, and this is, like you said, volume one, uh, number two. This is the second issue. Yeah. Um, and you have works from so many artists. What inspired you to take on a project like this? Well, I had I had self-published um, 
a couple of my own books. The, fir the first one, uh, Trace of Gold, started out with a conventional publisher and um, she didn't want to publish the second one and we had some disagreement about where I should be going with my writing. So I just took everything back and self-published and I thought after I got a handle on it, well, this is pretty easy. I could, you know, I could do this with some other stuff. And I have some friends who are creatives um, whose work I really respect. I'm in a couple of writing groups. Um, we get together, one group we get together once a month, another group we get together once a week. And these are all authors that I think they're great writers and they don't spare me at all. If they think that um, what I've just presented to the group was crap, they will tell me, but they will tell me exactly why. You know, they, they have the skill not only in writing, but also in being able to um, express what they don't like about it rather than just, I don't like this or I like this. It's, you know, you've, you've repeated this word three times in this paragraph, you need to go back or you've used a cliche here that's not working or I don't understand where this character is going. So, you know, I can, I can take that and um, help it, use it to help my own writing. Mm -hmm. Well, they've, they've all expressed to me at some point that they were having a difficult time finding a home for their work or um, that they felt like it was weird that literary journals don't accept previously published work. So once you publish something, even if it's just on your own blog, and you know, right. only the 30 people that come to look at your blog once a month are going to read it. Other literary journals won't publish it. So I said, well, that's not fair. These things deserve a second life. So I, for the first issue, I went to a bunch of friends and said, yeah, I'm going to put this together. And if you want to have work in it, send me a couple pieces to choose from and I'll publish it. And I think we had, I don't know, maybe a dozen people for that issue. And I had such a good time doing it. It was so successful that I thought, well, let's open it up. So I opened submissions up to anybody and um, used a submission manager called Duosuma online mm -hmm. and got uh, well over 100 submissions and had to then cut that down to a, a reasonable number. We, we sort of decided on just a little over 100 pages. I think this issue is 112 pages something like that, um, primarily for financial reasons. Um, because we're publishing art and photography as well as writing, we're printing in color. Yeah. And um, printing in color is expensive. So at 112 pages, if I sell a print issue, um, the publisher's compensation for that is 60 cents. If we were to go up to 114 pages, I'd be losing like 25 cents an issue. Oh. Um, on, the, on the first issue, I did a lot of advertising and I paid for the um, the premium color rather than the, the standard color printing and mm -hmm. wound up losing about $400 on that issue. Oh. So, so this issue, I am anticipating breaking even. Um, Plus, and that, that doesn't include the amount of time that you've put into this. No, no, I'm not. I'm not paying yeah. myself a salary. This is this is something that I'm doing because it's fun and because I'm, I I feel like um, I want to be able to help people whose work I appreciate get that work out into the public domain, out into the public sphere. Um, one of the things about creatives is that they need an audience they appreciate an audience um you know the process of painting or writing or um, taking photographs is in itself rewarding and it ought to be re reward enough but you know we all have egos we'd all like to get stroked we'd all like to have somebody say oh you know I, you really moved me with that poem that you wrote or gosh what a great image you know? But art is is like music too. It it works best when other people share it. You know, other people 
bring to it their own experiences and everyone has like a different experience, whether it's a song or poetry or yeah. a visual right. art. So um, I, I think art by its nature is meant to be shared. I do too. There's a, there's a, a great image that um, one of my writing instructors used. She went up to the blackboard and drew a big triangle and said, one corner is you, one corner is your art, the other corner is your audience, um, your reader or your viewer if you're, you're a painter. So as soon as you finish that, you put it out into the world, it's up to the audience to interpret what you've done. You know, you no longer have control of it. So yeah. if you want to express something specific, you've got to be certain that you're doing a good job of expressing that because, you know, once it's out there, it's up to them to figure out what you're talking about, what you're trying to say. Right. Yeah. Um, so is Lit Bop a little bit different in that it has both visual art and and I, I don't read a lot of literary magazines, but I, I haven't seen too many with with both. Well, there's there, there are more of them that are starting to, to do it. Um, and I think that what they're doing is either using black and white art illustration so that they don't have the big expensive color. or sometimes they're having um, a color section tipped in so that um, oh. you know it, it's black and white printing throughout most of it and then there are a couple of um, sections that have color illustration um, so so I guess we're not entirely unique in that respect. It used to be that literary magazines would, would just publish, you know, short fiction and poetry. Um, mm -hmm. But more of them are doing um, art photography now. I think the thing that, that sort of sets Lit Bob apart, though, is that we're willing to publish stuff that's been published before. So everybody... Most literary, literary magazines or magazines in general um, buy first American serial rights, which means that they get to publish it first. And then after that, the rights revert back to the author or the artist. Um, I don't insist on any rights. The, the rights for everything in Litbop are owned by their creators outright. And they've given me permission to publish their work. And, that's it. So if it's been published someplace before, fine. If they want to publish it someplace else afterwards, that's fine too. Yeah. That's kind of, that's really cool. I, I mean, it should be like that, don't you think? Across the board. <laughs> I, I do. Um, you know, good, good writing, good painting, good photography. It is what it is. And it, sh and it should have, it shouldn't have a shelf life, you know? It right. Or a limited audience. Right. right. Yeah. You know, if you if you get um, your work published in, a, you know, there are a lot of journals that have, have turned into online literary journals now because publishing is difficult. People aren't buying as, as many things on the newsstand as they used to. Magazines are struggling. So um, people are, are publishing stuff online. Well, you know, it's up there for a month. And then it's gone or it's archived and then the next stuff pops up. So, you know, um, how many people click on your story and read it online on their computer or on their phone? Um, it's really limited. And so, yeah, I think people right. should be able to, to have a, a, a longer life for their work. Um, right. You know, Lip Bop, we're publishing both the... Um, the print edition, which is print on demand, um, which means we don't have a warehouse full of that stuff. You order it from your bookstore or Amazon or Barnes and Noble, and one gets printed and shipped to you. Um, it's also in a Kindle edition. So if you have a, a reader, you know, um, then you can buy the, Pop it up there. the yeah. Kindle edition and then you've got it. It's, it's on your phone or your your, your pad or your computer or whatever yeah. it's yours yeah um and and another thing i thought that was interesting was um that this this issue focuses on the theme of loss um is that something that you planned or i mean how did that come about yeah i didn't plan that um 
like I said, we got well over a hundred submissions and um, it just so happened that the, the work that I felt was, was the most engaging. I don't wanna say best necessarily, but was most engaging was work that dealt with loss. Um, we should probably tell viewers that you have a story in this issue of Lit Pop that, that deals with loss. It's, it a, it's a wonderful story. And I'm so happy that um, we snagged it. We should also mention that Thank the, the um, submission process for Lit Pop is what's known as a blind submission process. Right. We would not accept any work that had somebody's name or any other identifying characteristics on it. Um, we wanted to read the work or see the artwork and photography without knowing who submitted it because I don't want to be tempted to print something by a famous or popular artist, creator, um, just because of that person's name. I want, to, name. I want to publish work that I think is, is good, that will be valuable to our audience to read. Yeah, so, and, and I was, thank you for taking my story too um, and for publishing it in here too. I, I was honored <laughs> that you liked it and- uh, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which brings me to another thing that I wanted to mention about this. So um, we had to turn down some stuff that was was worthwhile just because we didn't have space for it. Um, and I hope, hope those people will resubmit last year. But we also ran up against a lot of submissions that were obviously written by people who we're sort of just starting out. And mm -hmm. that's great because we want people to um, learn to write and to enjoy writing and to engage in that process, whether it's fiction or poetry. Um, but it's important to, to do the work before you submit stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, take a class. Um, I belong to two writers groups and um, I get great feedback from them. So if you're yeah. an aspiring writer, an aspiring author, hook up with other writers. Um, right. Get them to hurt your feelings because hurting your feelings is the way that you learn. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I belong to two critique groups now and, um, and I've had a lot of editors tell me how terrible my writing is. But you do learn from that. You learn a lot. And, if, and you if learn... they can tell you why they think that, then absolutely. Yeah. If they... If they just say they're a bad writer. No, really but you know, right. If they can explain to you what, what's missing, what's, what's off, you know, yeah, exactly. um, then, then it helps you to learn ways to put that into the writing so that everyone understands what you're trying to say. Yeah. And if your spouse or your mom says, Oh honey, this is wonderful. Don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> With a grain of salt. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, they love you. They, they don't want to hurt your feelings. So, you know, understand it for what it is. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, so um, I think that we've covered just about everything. Um, where so, can, where can. You had asked me when you sent me the list of questions, you had asked me um, for influences for my. Oh, book. yeah. Yeah. And I. I do want to cover that because okay. I think that the people that, that have really inspired me, um, some of our viewers might want to check them out. So oh, okay. a lot of people that, a lot of artists that people probably are familiar with, John Singer Sargent, um, a guy named Joaquin Sorolla, who is a master of um, painting light. Um, his work is, is absolutely brilliant. Um, Picasso, when he first started, was doing work that was more traditional, and he was in a circle of um, of people in Barcelona. Another guy who worked with him named Ramon Casas. Um, his work is is uh, brilliant for that time period that they were they were both working together in Barcelona. Picasso's work after he um, moved. Um, to France and started doing uh, Cubist work is, is great. Um, 
Can I show the painting that's behind you? I have it yeah, in up absolutely. here in the magazine. Mm -hmm. And um, you probably won't be able to read what it says there. Yeah, so but, yeah. that that piece, actually what it says it, on this um, yellow coat by this character who was one of the first comic strip characters, a guy named the Yellow Kid who was like um, a kid who was a street urchin. Uh, it says, a guy what gots two coats should share with a guy what gots none. So the title of this painting is um, Salome, and she is uh, kissing the head of John, De John the Baptist, or as the yellow kid would say, John the Baptist. <laughs> uh, so, And I so, also mentioned that people that the artists that you just mentioned are mm -hmm. listed here on your page in the magazine too. So if people yeah. are interested. So the guy that, that inspired this and a couple of the other pieces I'm currently working on, um, uh, he died back in, back in the eighties, late eighties, I think Jean-Michel Basquiat. And his work is really reminiscent of comic book art. It's two dimensional, it's very colorful. I love comic books. I grew up reading comic books. I still read comic books. They've been um, very uh, influential both in my art and my writing. Um, so, and, you know, Marvel comics. Make mine Marvel. You know, I'm a Marvel. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Just, just wanted to put some of those names of artists out there for people. Oh, and um, speaking of work that has a relation to comic book art, um, Japanese woodcuts, um, um, Hokusai, a um, couple of others. There's a guy who was working in the 30s named uh, Kawase Hasui, who did work that looks like the ancient Japanese woodcuts, but has modern scenes in it. Um, I yanked one down from the wall. I don't know if you'll be able to to see this oh but oh wow so this is a this is a, a rural japanese village um with telephone lines uh -huh. so uh -huh. he did this like i said back in the back in the 1930s and his style very reminiscent of um uh 18th 19th and 18th century japanese wood Worth checking out. Interesting. And I see your music in the background too. You play a horn, right? I do. I play saxophone. Um, that is, um, what is that? That's um, Charles Mingus, Goodbye Pork by Hat, his uh, tribute to Lester Young. That's amazing. Well, you have no shortage of create creativity for sure. And um, and definitely no shortage of mediums to to express yourself. I have a short attention span is what it is. <laughs> I just have to keep doing stuff. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for talking to me today, Tim. Tell readers um, first where they can find Lit Bop and then where they can find you. Okay, so Lit Bop, um, uh, you can check out the website, litbop.com. Um, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Barnes and Noble. Your local bookstore can order it. And um, you can find me on uh, timchapmanauthor.com or thrillingtales, all one word, dot com. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Tracy. This was fun. All right. Good to see you. Bye.